I remember the first bat which was bought for me. My mom, dad, I don't know if they got a sponsor to do it. I remember clearly it was a Slazenger V500. The Slazenger bat, you know, it had the, 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 the tiger on the, on, the, on the back of it. That was in green. That was in green. I remember it was like neatly varnished. It was still in plastic. Um, my mom took it out and, and gave it to me. And mm-hmm. I mean, I can tell you, I slept with that bat. <laughs> I, I walked. Hi, Kavita. You need Am I to... twisted? You are. Am I twisted? Sorry. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it happens. I keep seeing you getting trouble to do these live interviews, Dang. What's yes. happening with your tech skills? <laughs> well, I, I, I had an, an incident with uh, ESPN uh, Cricket. I Info saw that. With mm-hmm. Rana Kapoor. Uh, I was ex- expecting him to come on my live. And he was expecting me to get on his live. So there was a little bit of miscommunication, but eventually we got it right. Yeah, but all in good fun. I mean, we could always send Sanjay for you if you need help. (laughs) Yeah, he's quite good. Um, Tell him I'm improving. So I'll let him know if I need uh, that sort of technical assistance. Uh, don't worry, he's right here because I also need the technical assistance. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. But how how have you been? I've been good. Um... I must say uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, viewing. Um, mm-hmm. I've been trying to keep myself positive during uh, this COVID-19 period. Uh, everyone, yeah. I think, has been challenged in some form or fashion, whether it's economically, socially, uh, in terms of mental health. Um, mm-hmm. We've been faced with, with unprecedented times, so to speak, and... Um, I, I must say, luckily for me, you know, my family, my friends, they've been able to insulate me through this tough period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know, or I, I think for somebody like you, who is always hard to, to track down and, you know, you're always jetting off to here or there for work purposes. Um, was it hard for you to stay put? Yes um, and no. Uh, yes, from the point of view of, for the last, what, three or four years, um, I've been traveling extensively um, for work with the University of the West Indies, where I work in the Faculty mm-hmm. of Sport, and then with international broadcasting and my responsibilities and uh, obligations there. So uh, jumping on a plane is, is a normal thing for me. Um, mm-hmm. When the lockdown started, we were actually scampering to return home from India where we were participating in this uh, UN Academy uh, World Series. Um, okay. Some retired players playing in a tournament in India under the, the sort of uh, um, auspices of the Indian government uh, uh-huh. to raise awareness about road safety. So we had played uh, two matches in that tournament. And then, you know, things just got you know, really, really bad with regard to COVID-19. So they had to suspend the tournament. We had to scamper to get back to Trinidad. Luckily, we did get back in time before the borders closed. Um, Mm -hmm. And since then, my only trip, I would say, Kavita, was a trip to Tobago. And that happened last weekend. So I was able to satisfy my flying desire to some extent (laughs) after three and a half months. Um, Yeah. But I've, I've enjoyed my time in Trinidad. Um, it's good to be in one place uh, for an extensive period of time. You know, I've yeah. had a couple of things that I've been working on. So uh, I can't complain at all, to be quite honest. Yeah. And it's always nice to get the family time because you, you don't often get that at all. Correct. Um, that is something that uh, in the sort of uh, lifestyle that I live, it's something that I cherish always. Because uh, many of the times, you don't really determine your schedule to a large mm-hmm. extent. Your schedule is, is pretty much determined for you. And I'm sure you've been talking a lot with the TKR players. They would t- tell you that. The, the guys yeah. who are currently playing 
uh, professional cricket, they would tell you that your schedule is dictated by the number of competitions, uh, the obligations that mm -hmm. you have, the opportunities that come before you. So it might seem like a simple life um, from the point of view of you not having to worry too much, but it's, it's very complicated. Um, it's a very lonely life as well because you find yourself living out of a suitcase and, and you can't take all your friends and family with you all the time. So, so it's, it's, it's tough off the field, so to speak, as a cricketer. But mm -hmm. there are its benefits as well for doing that. And it's a sacrifice that you're making because you can't play cricket uh, for your, your entire life. Yeah. Well, we saw you, a little video of you doing some stunt driving at home. What was yes. up with <laughs> Whose idea was that? <laughs> well, as you know, we were, we were all confined to, to our spaces within our homes. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, because of the fear of, of catching this virus didn't even step outside their door um, mm -hmm. because they didn't want to, to put themselves at risk. Um, I was actually at my parents' home and in Barapo, I can tell you, you you've been here, Kavita, so you know it's, yeah. it's yeah. you know, wide open spaces. Uh, in fact, I had bought my parents uh, two ATVs uh, for their wedding anniversary. That was about five or six years ago. And uh, as usual, they didn't really use it that much. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was parked up for like years, being underutilized. So during this lockdown period, I had the opportunity to service both of these ATVs. And then, you know, when you service an ATV, you've got to run it for a little you bit. It's like run. a car. When you've, when you've parked it for a long time, you've got to give it a run. And now it's actually being used by myself. My nephews, they, they even more look forward to coming to Barapo, not just because of my, <laughs> my mom, but because of the ATVs, because they get a chance to drive it all down in the back and have fun with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it looked like good fun and thankfully you were safe. <laughs> yeah, thankfully. I mean, I didn't go too extravagant. Let's leave it like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we usually catch up with you around March when the Daranganga Cricket Academy takes flight. And we had just started advertising it, actually, when everything had to lock down and we had to stop the ads because you guys, uh, you know, even before we had the stay-at-home order, you made the decision to at least postpone the academy for a while to see how things go. So I think that was a good move. And we we missed catching up with you. Since then... Um, you guys have started doing some of the sessions via Zoom. Indeed. Um, and this was really something that we felt necessary to transition kids back into that uh, mode of, of wanting to play, uh, enjoying the game of cricket. Uh, we had to suspend uh, this year's academy because of obvious mm -hmm. reasons, COVID-19 and the risks involved. Um, but what we did is we started an online session every Friday for all the kids in our academy and even kids who uh, showed an interest in wanting to know and wanting to continue their development in the sport of cricket, we invited them on, on online. And, and I can say um, with, without any fear of contradicting myself, if anyone looking on or any, any parents looking on would like to join our online session, I don't know how long it will be because we are adapting mm -hmm. and adjusting to you know, the measures and regulations uh, implemented by our health authority. So they're free to join. Um, we normally send a Zoom link to mm -hmm. all of our participants via their parents or even to the youngsters themselves. And we, every Friday, we follow a syllabus which we've uh, developed where we will continue the development of young uh, cricketers and this is a continuation of uh, the Academy's work uh, that we have done over the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine the kids would have been disappointed um, not being able to come to their weekly sessions. Uh, so I guess this was as good as it, it could get for them. Indeed. And, and Kavita, I must also mention that this online initiative was driven by the kids themselves. There was one okay. kid, uh, yeah, Severe uh, Needhan, who reached out to me, reached out to the office and said, 
You know, what are mm-hmm. we doing? We're anxious. We want to get back into training. Why don't you guys do something online so that we can continue our training? And on that recommendation, we acted on it because everyone was okay. still shocked about the entire scenario. People were still trying to find their feet with regard to what they can do, what they cannot do. A lot of speculation in terms of when will we be able to engage in that sort of group like sporting activity. And we took that recommendation and we ran with it. And, and that's the neat yeah. and the great thing about the Academy and, and the foundation itself. It's not a one man show. It's not driven by one person. Um, we actually do make our members feel like they're part and parcel of, you know, what happens within the foundation. Yes. Our core focus is really on uh, youth development, uh, using sport, using scholarship programs to help mm-hmm. enable young people build capacity to have them be better young citizens so that they can be role models within their communities, their schools, their families. And that is what we've been able to achieve. And I'm very proud to say that um, we continue to welcome uh, ideas and recommendations from, from everyone associated with the Daranganga Foundation. Yeah. And I mean, we are always proud to be a sponsor, Caribbean Lifestyle Communications. You know that, Darren, we've been with you guys from the beginning. And as long as you allow us, we will continue to support the foundation and the Cricket Academy because it's great yeah. work you guys do. I must, uh, again, whenever I get the opportunity, I must say it publicly. Um, your company, your establishment, uh, there are a lot of corporate entities in Trinidad that support sport and you know, the development of Tran Tobago. And I'd like to publicly say that the contributions that uh, Caribbean Lifestyle Communication has made towards the Daranganga Foundation is invaluable. Um, you guys don't only talk the talk, you walk, walk the talk pretty much. And for that, on behalf of the entire executive and membership, we, we are thankful. And we hope that we will continue to collaborate and, and, and build upon this partnership that we have. Yes. Well, something else that we are proud to be a part of, for 90.5 at least, is to be a sponsor of the Trinbago Night Riders. So what do you think will happen with CPL? We're hearing different things, that they want to have it. Maybe they'll have all the games here in Trinidad. What, what do you see? Well, to tell the honest truth, I mean, I'm intimately involved in the Caribbean Premier League, as you know, not as a player, but uh, as a broadcaster. Um, I've been there from the very second year. Uh, the first year, my uh, sort of contractual obligations didn't allow me to be involved. But I've been there from the onset. And I must say that uh, the CPL has contributed significantly towards the development of cricket in the region. Uh, it has uh, created a platform for, for cricket and talent to not just play for the West Indies, but to play cricket across the globe. Um, I'm very proud to say that what they've also supported, that's the CPL. They've also supported meaningful partnerships and collaborations. And one such uh, is a collaboration with the University of the West Indies Faculty of Sport. Uh, in 2019, January, the Faculty of Sport at the University hosted a World Universities uh, T20 tournament where we had universities from around the world and in the region uh, come and play against each other in a tournament. And CPL was a partner to that tournament. And the incentive in that tournament was that the top five players, uh, batsman, bowler, both fast and slow, uh, wicketkeeper and fieldsman will get a chance to be positioned with CPL franchisees. And mm-hmm. they got the opportunity to do so. And that strategically, if you follow uh, sport development that pretty much is taking uh, amateur sport or tertiary sport and connecting it with professional sport. And, you know, I always talk extensively about uh, a sport development pathway. And in this particular instance, it's cricket. So I like to know what is a cricketer's player development pathway. And I think if we can strengthen that pathway for development, then we will have a better product at the end, meaning a quality cricketer that can be world-class. So I see that connection and that partnership as instrumental in strengthening that player development pathway. It now mm-hmm. offers persons who are academically inclined a chance to pursue boots. And, and, and I can say, not to be boastful or anything like that, but um, I've lived that life for majority 
of my cricket career, you know, being able to balance my cricket with my academic interests. And when I just started, I didn't really have the avenue to do so because of how inflexible our academic institutions were at the tertiary level. Now with the mm -hmm. advent of uh, online uh, studies and online programs, you can actually pursue uh, your goals and dreams, both academically and in that extracurricular uh, realm as well. Yeah. But what do you think might happen with CPL for this year? Do you think it's going to take off? Well, I mean, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, but I know the draft has already happened. I know mm -hmm. that um, there is a proposal before the government of Trinidad and Tobago and um, right. Even the chairman of the sport company of Trinidad and Tobago did speak confidently that that proposal will be approved. Um, mm -hmm. I know that the CPL is awaiting the final sign-off of that proposal so that they can press the green light to put all arrangements in place. I know by virtue of the draft happening um, last week, Wednesday, all teams are pretty much confirmed and uh, franchisees are in the mode of preparing themselves for a tournament in 2020. What I'm hearing is I'm hearing that the format will, will take place where you play one round of double header matches at the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. Mm -hmm. Then you rest that facility because with the number of matches, you want the pitch to have a chance to be uh, reconditioned and prepared again uh, for right. more matches. So that one week off, will allow for the tournament to move to the Queen's Park Oval, where it will be played there with double header matches as well. And then it will return to the Brian Lara Cricket Academy to finish the entire tournament. And they're hoping, all things mm -hmm. being equal, that maybe to the back end of the tournament, um, spectators will be allowed to come in and to see matches live. That's if the national situation doesn't... Um, get out of hand or go to a yeah. stage where um, the health authorities uh, will have to insert strict regulations. Yeah. How, how do you think it's going to be for the players, though, if they don't have the crowd support? I mean, y you would know this. H how does it feel if, or how do you think it feels? Because have you ever played an empty, empty stadium? I, I don't mm, know. Yeah, I mean, when we played in, in Sharjah, in early 2000, um, when we played against Pakistan there, um, the stadium that we played in, in Sharjah, mm -hmm. wasn't filled to capacity. We had one section of the stands right. filled. Um, I think I've played a, a couple matches where we didn't have any spectators. I mean, usually first-class cricket in the Caribbean, if you're playing up the islands, you don't really get many spectators. Crowd. So... You, you feel it and you, you're aware of it as a player, I can tell you that. So it will be very different uh, for many of the players who are playing in, in this year's CPL because that is what adds to the ambience, uh, Kavita. It's like you walking to work in your office and no one is there. Everybody's working remotely. It, it feels weird yeah. because yeah. you would have been accustomed to that human interaction. You would have been accustomed to that for want of a better word, that noise that happens around you in, in your bubble, in your professional space. And when that is no longer there, it, it is identifiable. And the same will happen with the players when they play to, to, to an empty stadium, as in the Bralara Stadium or even in the Queen's Park Oval. And it is something that they will have to adjust to. Um, I can tell you the same will happen for us as broadcasters in the I commentary box. I was going box. to ask. Yeah, I was going to ask because, I mean... You guys, you know, sometimes too, particularly for CPL, we see you go into the crowd to, you know, talk to the crowd, some of the members uh, and patrons there. And I don't know, you're not going to be able to, same thing, have that energy from the crowd either. Yeah, um, it's, it's going to be tough. I mean, I know that Danny Morrison is being engaged uh, to be part of um, the CPL. And we know how he is an excitable personality and he feeds off the crowd. So I think it will be a very tempered Danny Morrison uh, in this year's CPL if, if, if the crowd is not there. Um, yeah. But I, I get, at the end of the day, I think what we need to find comfort in, we need to find comfort with the fact that uh, 
millions of people will be looking at these matches remotely. And right. these matches will still be providing entertainment uh, for a lot of people across the globe. And, and whilst we may not have many persons witnessing matches live, there are mm -hmm. millions of persons who will be following the game. And, and that is the trend in which sport has been moving into and towards, um, you know, in terms of revenue, that is where most of the promoters and the administrators of sport generate most of their revenue from not just gate receipts, yeah. but from TV rights. TV rights. And it's, it's not a new thing. It's, it's, it's very common. Um, it will be different, especially the Trinidad Spectator public who are accustomed mm -hmm. to going to the, to the facility, to the grounds, you know, having a great time, dressing in different costumes, participating in the event itself. I think that is what makes us unique, uniquely West Indian. And, and to yeah. not have the opportunity to do that, I think it will be a little bit disappointing for, for fans and spectators. Yeah. Uh, some time ago, I had seen Mr. Venki Maiso, the CEO of the Trinbago Night Riders. He had uh, retweeted something from a, a football match in Denmark where the stadium was empty, but what they had done was a huge Zoom call so that patrons were able to, I guess, secure their, their seats in whichever stand they would. And the whole, around the whole stadium was screens that they set up. So the patrons were actually on watching via Zoom to the football match. Um, I don't know if you saw that, but that would be a fantastic thing if eventually, you know, games, not just football, but maybe other sports as well could, could get engaged um, in something like that. I, I mean, it must be hard to set up, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I think it might be very expensive as well. But what, yeah. I, what I also want to say, I mean, I don't know if you looked at uh, any of the premiership matches when the tournament uh, restarted. And mm -hmm. in terms of production, there are ways of, of making... Um, a match or a game much more attractive to someone viewing on their television set. And, right. and that is with the background noise. That is with how the cameras are positioned and how they focus on the field because there are ways that you can focus a camera. Just say, for instance, in football, you can position your camera and zoom your camera in such a way that you very rarely get images outside of the playing arena. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure if it's possible with cricket, and I know that what they did is they took uh, pre-recorded um, reactions from fans specific okay. to the actual team playing. So, if Arsenal was playing against Man City, you had um, reactions from Arsenal fans mm -hmm. clipped up from before in the past in matches. And they would actually run that as background song. So when Arsenal is on the, on the charge, you will hear that support going Arsenal's way. And on the other hand, if Man City is, is, is taking control, you would hear the same for them. So as a viewer, you think mm -hmm. that there are hundreds of people at the game when, quite frankly, there are not many persons there. But they create yeah. the ambience for the spectating public at, at their homes and and those watching remotely. So technology is a hell of a thing. And um, yeah. I think we're going to continue seeing uh, more and more modern technology in terms of production, because so many people will now be confined to watching sport um, in, their, in their private areas. Yeah, and really, I mean, it's, it's forcing us to become creative, basically. Indeed. Indeed. So, well, let's ask you a few little fun questions. A couple of these, I, I did ask some of the TKR players when we were interviewing them for Nights Unplugged. Do you remember your, or, or what is your earliest memory of playing cricket? Uh, it will be uh, when I was a student at Rio Claro Vedic School. My dad was a teacher there, and I think mm -hmm. I was about mm, seven or eight. That would have been in standard mm -hmm three or standard four. So at that time, I wasn't right. a part of the school's team, but I was good enough to be in and around playing with the big boys, so to speak. Mm. And I remember 
clearly this this is this is vivid in my mind. There was a game that uh, I think it was Rio Claro Vedic versus Pool RC, and that's a region what you you zoned off in, in in regions in primary school cricket, and we were playing at the Kildare Recreation Ground. I mean, for persons who live in Rio Claro, Mayaro environs, they will know these areas inside out Tabakit Road, mm-hmm. uh, because I went majority of my primary school life was up in in that area. And I can remember sitting in the pavilion. And in those days, cricket was played with one side of pad. Yes, it was hardball. But when you're competing against another school, you're still playing with your short khaki pants and your blue shirt. So <laughs> both teams were playing, playing with that uniform, right? Mm-hmm. And the guys batting had one side of pad. So if you're right-hander, you're left foot. If you're left-hander, you're right foot. And some guys chose not to bat with any batting gloves. Yes, I right. think there were protector boxes <laughs> that were used. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but you had the choice of either using a glove or not using a glove. And the glove, batting gloves used were gloves mm-hmm. that looked like, um, what do you call those gloves? It's like, we call it inners. It's like, you know, those garden, garden gloves that you oh, wear? Oh, the garden gloves. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. So it's just like uh, either cloth or with a little bit of uh, rubber fabric. And on the right. back of it had something that looked like we all know what's shut eyeing, right? Like shut in. Yeah. That yeah. the fruit the fruit, yeah. So yes. you know it's spiky and green. So the back of it mm-hmm. had these like sort of torn like looking rubber um <laughs> things on the back that offered a little extra protection. And 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 that is clear to me. I was sitting in the pavilion looking there and one of my teachers turned to me, I'll never forget this, and he said, Darren, you think you're ready to play? And to go on bat because Rick Laravidic was having a horrible time against Pool RC. And he turned right. to me and he said, you ready to play? And I turned to him confidently and said, yes, I'm ready to play. <laughs> and and that, that was, if not my first memory that I, could re- that I, that I know of with regard mm-hmm. to cricket. I mean, I played, I played at home, but that is just before I started playing for my primary school. Um, right. and, and that will be my first memory. Yeah. Do you remember if you all won the game? I don't think we won the game. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, a good, wasn't a good outcome, uh, but I wasn't a member of the team. I was a, like supporting cast. Right. And eventually, eventually I got into the team. Eventually we had a little more success. And, um, mm. and yeah, that is where I really started honing my skills and getting more and more involved in the sport of cricket. Yeah. Do you remember who gave you your first cricket bat? Well, to tell the honest truth, Kavita, I mean, I think it's well documented, my story coming out of Barapo. Um, thankfully, my community and my family in this area had a club that played cricket. Right. And a lot of the resources um, that the club had um, those things were loaned to young aspiring cricketers. So I never had my personal bat until I was probably a, a teenager. So mm-hmm. those matches at primary school, even when I started playing for Trinidad on the 13, a lot, if not all of the equipment that I use, those were club equipment. Um, right. Owned by the club back then, it was Apollo 11 Sports Club. So I, I went into the club um, kit bag and I took the bat. I mean, mind you, some of the bats were a little bit heavier than what you'd expect a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old to use, but mm-hmm. I had no choice. And, um, and yeah, so, so you always heard of the incentive of if you score a 100, young man, I'll buy a bat for you. And I remember, I'll share the story with you, Kavita. I remember the first bat which was bought for me. My mom, dad, I don't know if they got a sponsor to do it. I remember clearly it was a Slazenger V500. The Slazenger bat, you know, it had the, 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 the tiger on the, on, the, on the back of it. That was okay. in green. That was in green. I remember it was like neatly varnished. It was still in plastic. Um, my mom took it out and, and gave it to me. And mm-hmm. I mean, I can tell you, I slept with that bat. <laughs> I, I walked all over with that bat. I actually, I remember when I toured England, in 1995, as captain mm-hmm. of a Toronto Tobago school boys uh, team, that was the bat that brought so many runs to me. 
and and by virtue of my production of runs in that tournament, that is how I was invited to join Tran and Tobago senior team, and 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 that's how you know opportunities came about. To be honest. Wow. Was there or who was the most intimidating bowler you ever faced? You think? Oh, um, I would say Shoaib Akhtar. Um, okay. And the reason why I say Shoaib Akhtar, and for many of you cricket connoisseurs will understand this, right? Um, as an opening batsman, mm -hmm. you sort of prepare yourself for the fastest, the most aggressive. Uh, bowlers around. If you don't have that expectation, then you can't really open the batting because you've got to embrace that. Some some persons they don't like to face up to good fast bowling, to aggressive bowling. They don't like the fact that they have to face a hard new ball, which is mm -hmm. always a challenge. Um, they don't like the idea of them having to be like the guinea pig, so to speak. Because you're walking out there to bat to face the new ball. You don't know what the pitch conditions are like. You don't know what the, the, the opposition bowlers are like. So you're going virtually into an unknown. And that is where I feel as an opening batsman, you've got to have much more self-confidence in your ability and what you can do. And um, Shoei Bakhtar, as an opening bat, uh, bowler, was very aggressive. He was one of the fastest bowlers uh, in world cricket at the time when we competed. Uh, he was one of the most feared, most aggressive um, fast bowlers. Him, in my era, if you think about fast bowlers and genuine fast bowlers, you'd think of uh, Schoebachter, you'd think of Brett Lee, you'd think of Steve Harmison. Um, these are guys who were rapid. When I say rapid, 150 clicks with a new ball, and they were aggressive as well. And the thing about it is they just didn't only bowl short to get you on the head or to, you know, to instill some fear. They had very mean Yorkers as well. And when you're facing a guy who can bowl 150 kilometers per hour with a delivery finishing at your head, but at the same time, bowl the same speed mm -hmm. for a delivery finishing at your two, that is when you know you've got to be at your best. And, and for me, Shoei Bakhtar, when I, when I played against him in Sharjah, in, in, in maybe I think that was 2002, um, mm -hmm. he was on top of his career. He was fit. And for guys like Brett Lee and Day, and, and I'm going a little bit deep into cricket, and I know you'll understand this, right? Yeah, Kavita, yeah, because, go ahead. because you understand the sport, right? I've, I've seen you play a cover drive. I've seen you bat already, right? So I know, <laughs> I know you understand this thing, right? So, so it's when you see a guy like Brett Lee running into bowl, his action is a genuine conventional action, where when you mm -hmm. stand, when you stand at the batting crease and you look up to Brett Lee. He's at the top of the mark and you can see him running in with the speed that he runs in with. So there's a certain sense of readiness uh, right. that you find yourself uh, in because of you seeing, monitoring and having the ability to time him. Meaning mm -hmm. time, backlift movement, getting into that readiness to play. Shoei Bakhtar on the other hand, and these are little nuances that bowlers use. He would run from behind the umpire. So if you're standing on your crease and you look to Shoei Bakhtar, he's hiding himself behind the umpire at the top of his mark. And why is that? Mm -hmm. Because what he's trying to do is he's trying to break your ability to time and get yourself in a state of readiness. So he will sprint directly behind the umpire and then at the last minute veer out to deliver. And in that way, you only get a short, sighting of him before he actually delivers the ball. So that's right. one challenge that he has over a lot of other bowlers, fast bowlers. The second thing is, by virtue of his action, he's got a slingy type action. It's not a front-on, chess-on, conventional action. He runs in, his arm is down, his bowling arm is down, and then he gets side on, and it's, he's been called numerous times for chucking as well. Then he gets right. side on, and delivers the ball. So because of that slingy type action, it's very difficult to time that as well. 
So all those things make him a very difficult proposition when it comes yeah. to facing a bowler. Wow. Kept you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think would be a bowler now in present day cricket? Any format, doesn't matter, any country, um, that you might be intimidated by if you had to face him? Mm, I think Jasprit Bumrah. And the reason why I say that is it's very strange as, as, as a batsman or when you're a batsman and there's a guy who's running up, well, a guy who is attempting to bowl to you when for mm-hmm. half of his run-up, he walks. So I spoke about that state of readiness. It's like yeah. this, Kavita, let me just draw an analogy. If you're standing in the middle of the road and there's a car that is driving at 10 kilometers per hour, and say that car gets within 10 feet of you, would you, have a, would you be fearful of, of that car? You might not because you will think that you have a lot of reaction time. But if I tell you that same car will eventually move to 100 kilometers per hour after going at 10 kilometers per hour, how would you feel standing up in the middle of the road? Yeah, you, you, you get no. the point that, yeah. I, that, yeah. that, that I'm making. Not safe at all. <laughs> Not yeah. safe at all. So what it does, it challenges your reaction time. So with a guy like Jasprit Bumrah, he is running to bowl to you as an opening bowler with a new ball, and he's mm-hmm. walking. So you're seeing somebody advancing. You're batting. You've got to tell yourself that this guy is going to be bowling 150 Ks. Yeah. Your naked eye doesn't see that. But you've got to plan that into your mind that, hey, I've got to get myself in a state of readiness to face 150 kilometers per hour. So that's the biggest challenge with a guy like Jasper Bumrah. Apart from his skill ability to swing the ball, to be accurate with his lines and lengths, that deception that you go through as a batsman in terms of a guy walking and just halfway into his run, then he will start to run. And it's not like a sprint and an aggressive. It's yeah. like a gentle jogging <laughs> to bowling. You, you, you yeah, understand very, what I'm saying? Very so, unassuming. Very unassuming. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. So I would say him. Which batsman would you feel most com- confident with when you were in the crease with him? Well, to be- tell you the honest truth, I mean... I, I opened the batting a lot of times with Chris Gale. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we always speak about uh, Desmond Haynes and Gordon Greenwich and how great an opening pair both uh, players have been for the West mm-hmm. Indies at the top of the innings and for such a long period of time. Um, I think they averaged close to 50 as an opening pair. But if persons didn't know, Next to Greenwich and Haynes is actually myself and Chris Gale in terms of most successful opening pair for the West Indies. We average about 45 or, or so opening the batting right. for the West Indies in Test cricket. So we've had a successful partnership at the top of the innings. And, and Chris is, in terms of body language, he is unassuming as well. Um, he doesn't really show his intensity and his desire uh, to be successful, he comes mm-hmm. across um, very laissez-faire, very laid back in his body language. But I can tell you, he's very intense inside. Yeah. Um, so I was very comfortable batting alongside him. One, because we've had a long history of playing alongside each other. We've played in under-19 World Cups together. We've played uh, in West Indies A teams together. Um, and we played for the West Indies together. So we, we virtually grew up together playing professional cricket. So, so I understand him as a person as well, not just yeah. as a cricketer. So, so I was very comfortable with him. Uh, even Bran Lara, Shivnarayan Chandapal, um, Ramnari Sawan, you know, persons who I share very good relationships with off the field and mm-hmm. uh, guys who we, we were very open with each other in terms of our game, in terms of our, our private life as well. And, um, and yeah, those are guys who, who I felt very comfortable playing alongside for West Indies. Yeah. 
and and I would say the hosts of of young players on a Toronto Tobago's landscape. So from the Darren Bravo to the Adrian Barrett to the Lendl Simmons um, mm -hmm. to Dennis Ramden to Pollard to Dwayne, all these guys were young Turks when I played, and in some small way. You know, I had to instill discipline. I had to instill a work ethic, which would not have only put them in good stead, but put our team in good stead. And we were able to enjoy um, a fair amount of success as a unit. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, all these guys, I had such a great time playing cricket alongside these guys, you know, and, and mentoring these guys when they were young, when they were excitable, you know, when mm -hmm. they needed a sense of direction. So today I look back and I, I see them doing well and I, and I feel very proud that uh, they are making something of, of their respective talent. You're making yourself sound a little old there, Darren. <laughs> I, I, I am, Kavita. <laughs> you're relatively. Not you're not, yeah, relatively. <laughs> yeah. And, and here's a, um, a last question for you. In terms of you becoming a commentator, was there any one commentator you would listen to and say, you know, it, it kind of inspired you to want to go in this direction after ending your, your cricket career? Kavita, I'll be quite honest with you. I hated commentary. Um, I, in my, I mean, I'm saying that, I'm being very honest and frank. Um, when I played, numerous times I'd be asked by the production company to mic up when matches had the opportunity for someone being mic'd up. I want to say mic'd mm -hmm. up, you know, put the your earphones in yeah. and, and play with that so that you can talk to the commentary and provide a different dimension uh, to the to the viewing uh, spectatorship. And then I would be invited to come in the commentary box and share my views. And as a captain, naturally, you'd be interviewed more than the the, the regular players. Mm -hmm. So it it is something that I had to prepare myself for. And I just did because it came with... With, with, with part of the responsibility of, of, of leading a team and captaining a team. I actually, in 2010, I think it was when there was a Cricket World Cup here in the Caribbean, I was asked by, uh, I think it was the broadcast company, I can't remember the exact name, to join yeah. the commentary panel. And, you know, after consideration, I said, why not? I'm still playing first-class cricket. I'll not be involved in the World Cup. Let me see what this is all about. So I was very much unaware of the yeah. protocols involved. I went in there um, like a day in bright lights. And I started, as per usual, and because of my formal grooming and training, I started to ask a lot of questions. I started to see you know, what guys did, understand the protocols involved. I even went as far as doing my research because I come with an academic background and naturally yeah. when I studied law, my way of sort of remembering and recollecting what I read is by taking notes while I read. So mm -hmm. if I'm reading a chapter that is 50 pages, I can condense that 50 page chapter into one sheet of, pa of paper where I could recall nearly everything about that 50 pages. And, and it's, it's something that I inculcated in my sort of course of study when I did law. Right. And for me, I felt that it was important for me to do some research into the players, statistically get a little bit, uh, to, uh, a, no a little bit of knowledge about their background, where they were, where they were born, you know, highlights of their career so I can speak fluently about this player like if I intimately know this player, right? Mm -hmm. And I started to take a notebook, Kavita, and make notes. So when mm -hmm. I started commentary, I would go on in the commentary box. Um, and if I'm alongside another commentator, I'll have my book there and mm -hmm. I'll be referencing things. I'll be looking at my book, but unknown to everyone that I was actually looking at my notes and, and making sure that my information was at my fingertips, right? Right. And I did that. And I got all these different comments and constructive criticism. And I took it in good stead. I mean, social media 
you know, tells you everything instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So if you say something wrong, you have about 10 minutes on Twitter <laughs> say, Darren, no, the fastest ball in the world is not Brett Lee. It's Sherb Actor who clocks on. So in that game, yeah. it will pin the la, 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 la. And I'm like, I do apologize. I'll correct myself. So I realized that you can never take back anything from the universe when you're doing commentary. So whatever you say, it's out there. It's either yeah. you decide to leave it or you decide to correct yourself. And sometimes, given the format that you're commentating on, time doesn't permit for you to go back and try and correct that. You've got to let it slide. You've got to take you know, the, the criticism that, 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 that come with it, right? Mm -hmm. So I never wanted to do commentary. I always wanted to play. So I felt that a commentator, because I, I looked at all these commentators and they were players from yester, 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 year, and not recent players, I'm like, I cannot do that because that's too dormant and, you know, docile for me. I, I was still playing. That's 2010. Mm -hmm. I finished, I think, in 2011. And I'm like, never. I can't see myself doing this. Anyways, after I did that one uh, stint, someone else reached out to me. Someone else reached out to me. I started to get all these commentators interacting with me on a regular basis, sharing their thoughts. I started to develop relationships with all these commentators, all these yeah. production companies. And by virtue of being immersed in commentary, I had no choice but to learn. I took it seriously. And every time I did commentary, I wanted to improve, Kavita. And, 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 and that is what has led me to where I am today, to be quite honest, a very organic, natural progression. And not that I said to myself, Darren, after playing, I want to be a commentator. Right. Well, sometimes, you know, these things just present themselves. And I mean, you, you, you took the, the, made the most of the opportunity, which, you know, I think is something you do all the time. And you always try to, you know, press the and, and, and mold the younger generation to do the same and I think you know people don't realize how much you you really do um, for the the younger generation in terms of cricket Darren but uh, we know here at, at, at Radio 90.5 and we always applaud you we're always proud of you and um, you know you always have our support thank you Kavita I mean and, and if I could just say I mean if I did not cultivate that I would say idea, that opportunity to do broadcasting, mm -hmm. what I do today would never have materialized. And, 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 and yeah. there, there are lessons to be learned in everything. And I always say that to young people, you might have a passion in one area, deep passion in one area, but in your course of action and your journey to realize that mean stream passion you mm -hmm. tend to have interactions with other little shoot-offs for want of a better word and i suggest in today's world don't close the door on those shoot-off or, or side opportunities because you never know that is what could create a niche for yourself and and who knows over time sometimes a passion dies sometimes you know, you change or you have a change in heart in terms of what you want to do. And it's those same little shoot-offs that you have cultivated along the way. Those things become major opportunities for you. And, and, and that's the world that we're living in. I, I can remember growing up in, in Barapa Rural, South Trinidad, the most important thing growing up in, a, in an Indian home was for you to get a good education, for you to have a wonderful family and for you to have a permanent job, right? That's, yeah. that's the ultimate dream for any parent. But, but I'm saying times have changed and, and persons are so multi-skilled now that you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into being one thing. I think as, yeah. as human beings, we, we can upskill ourselves. We can, we can make use of numerous opportunities with the time that you have and, and 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 i see it i mean i'm a living example of it for young persons out there there is an opportunity in every realm i'm not saying to do everything and spread yourself thin all i'm right. saying is 
in your core area, just see what are the offshoots and don't close the door on it. Try to cultivate them and to, you know, keep them running because they can become major opportunities for you. Wow, some very good advice from a relatively old gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. I just want to say a quick hi to folks who've been uh, viewing, Darren. Uh, we have Dina, Julian, Priya, Troy, Mohammed, Alvin Passad, Sherry Ram Logan, Dwayne, Aidan, um, Sam, Alex, Emily. So many of them will, you know, they've been viewing. So if you just want to say a quick hi to them before you leave. Yes. Uh, uh, hello. And uh, we're hoping that, um, you know, at some point in time, I'll get a chance to meet you all. Maybe at the back end of the CPL, because I'm sure mm -hmm. many of you follow the sport of cricket. Um, I know that I, I normally meet a lot of people through my academy as well. Um, I also do a lot of uh, graduation ceremonies and I did a lot in the past. And from time to time, Kavita, I go out and I meet a lot of those students who were graduates at that time, now right. into the working world as adults. And, you know, I'm confused. You know, I, I, I second guess myself. I said, Darren, you're no longer young again. You're, you're quite old, as you say. But it is such a, a fulfilling feeling uh, to meet people and to hear how you've impacted on them in some small positive way. I think mm -hmm. that to me is, is, is the most rewarding thing. Um, and, and to all of, of you listening and following on, um, I hope in some small way, myself and Kavita, we would have inspired you, impacted you in a positive way because you know, that is what building a nation is about, you know, helping each other, not putting down one another. And, um, yeah. and if you're in a position of influence, I think we all need to play our part to contribute positively towards a better, better Toronto Tobago. So hopefully one day I'll meet all of them. <laughs> all right, Darren. And hopefully we will be able to catch up with you in person soon enough. Um, but until then, you continue to stay safe, keep well, and uh, we will be in touch. Yep. And just wishing the 90.5 family, yourself and your family, all the best. And, um, you know, we will catch up during CPL. Waiting for some right. good news. Fingers Good crossed. News. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thanks again, Darren, so much for spending this time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye.